God is still moving. God is still being who he is. What happened at Asbury, I think it was just the beginning of God showing us that I'm still moving. God are able to cause a revival in the midst of a chapel service because I'm still God and I still move. That no man can predict my movement, but I reveal myself to men to show them that I'm still moving and I'm still causing my people to come and gather and seek my face and pouring out my presence upon them that changes them. God is still in that business. He still raised the dead. He still heals the sick. He still imparts inside of us his ways, his wisdom. He still wants us to fellowship and interact with who, who he is. He's our master. He's our Lord. He's our God. He's our redeemer. He's still moving. He's actively moving in us today. The body of Christ is gathered here. The Lord is moving in you today. This is your heart is beating and your blood is flowing. The Holy Spirit is moving and activating in you today because he would not deviate from off of what the Father said who he is. Our God is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. The Lord is the Spirit, and what the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's truth to that. And He's activating that in all of His believers that access that, that trust that, that relies on that. God is a covenant keeping God. He doesn't deviate off track because we deviate off track. He's still faithful to us. His promises are still yes and amen towards us. And His Holy Spirit still uh, resides and lives inside of us. When the Bible said, did you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? That wasn't just a nice scripture that was quoted. It was giving us access and open our eyes to understand what's inside of you. What's inside of you. What's taking place in you from saved and born again. It's not just an emotional move. It's the empowerment that comes about in you. It's the equipment that comes about in you. It's Christ in you. The hope of glory that comes apart in you. The glues you to the Father that gives you eternal life forever you live because of what Jesus has done. Now you carry that glory. You walk in that glory. Let your spirit sing songs unto the Lord. Rejoice in Him. The scripture says, again I say rejoice in the Lord because the joy of the Lord is our strength and it guides us and helps us and it pulls us to a closer relationship. Every encounter we have with the Lord just isn't for help's sake. It is to draw us closer to Him. It's for us to taste His goodness that He will reveal Himself this way to humanity to show them how faithful He is to us that we can see God's attributes coming from out of His sons and daughters. The visions, the signs, the healing, the miracles aren't just for us to ah, it's for us to say, God, you're that real. That you would do these things to reveal your love and your character and your nature before your children so that we can see our faith isn't in some so-called religious movement, but in a living God who's actively moving and causing signs and wonders to appear before us so that our faith can increasingly be more towards this God who does move mountains, who does heal, who does raise the dead, who does speak life who does declare liberty, who is holy, who is just, who is righteous, and that we are covenant with this. We're connected with this. We're not on the outer courts, we're in the inner courts. The veil has been torn. We have access now to enter into the holies of holies, into the most holy place, into fellowship with this God that we read about or hear preach. We have a right to fellowship with him. At any time, in any place, we have a right to fellowship with him. We have access to him. And he draws us to him through his spirit, through his word, to have this fellowship so that we can encounter the ancient of days. We can encounter the risen Messiah and be empowered by his spirit that's in us today. That stirs our hearts up. That reminds us and bear witness and testify. We have that access. We, the body of Christ, our Lord, what ministry have that access in us this morning? We don't have to go and manufacture something or make something up. The Lord gave us all that we need pertaining to life and godliness. Everything through His Holy Spirit. And we have it living inside of us. It's in you. Christ in you is the hope of glory. He's in you. He's not over all in Israel. 
or Jerusalem. He's here at Laurelwood and his belief us up, reminding us of who, how, who he is and how faithful he is to us to keep us closer, involved in an intimate relationship that he called us to walk in to remind us each and every day that he is our beloved and that we are his that we're covenant with him so Lord we thank you, we bless you if you have your Bibles please turn with me to the book of James, the first chapter Amen. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings, my brethren. Can it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him act in faith. Key factor. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith to up the things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But let him act in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let no man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Doubt. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass. Pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flowers fail, and its beautiful appearance perish. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desires has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, bring forth death. Do not be deceived, my brethren, my, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creation. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. But be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and, does, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For the observer himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a, for, a for, forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceive his own heart this one this one's religion is useless pure and undefiled religion before god and the father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world do we cannot all joy when facing Various trials. Do we count all joy when first when facing various trials? If we do count it all joy, the outcome is better. And in it, patience produces completeness and lacking nothing. 
do we count all joy when facing various trials? If we do count all joy, the outcome is better. And in patience, it produces completeness and lacking nothing. Verse 2. My brethren, count all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Embrace the trials, knowing that in the trials, your Father is there to keep you. That there is nothing that the Lord has given you to overtake you, but that you may know him more in your trials. And in your trials, the patience, the things that God is bringing out of you will come out. And in those patience, it produces completeness. He completing that spiritual man, that growth, that maturity. Breaking off the chaff of life or things that we bring into life, things that we endure, things that we went through. And the patience keep us more sound to the Lord. It keep us to be able to stand still for a moment. Instead of moving hastily and trying to make things happen our own way, speed up the process. Patience keep us in the process so that God can complete what he's doing. Haste make us move quickly because we want to be involved in it. No one wants to be involved in the trials or tribulations of life. I said no one sign up for that. But when it comes, we're to remain patient and let God complete what God is completing in us. That when we come out of, we won't be lacking nothing. But we move too fast, hastily, now we're lacking. Why? Because we moved before the Lord told us to move. Because why? We went off our own agenda. Our own mindset because we didn't like what we was going through or the trial that came against us. But the Father said, be in the midst of that trial, I'm going to give you the completeness that you need. Let that trial come. Count all joy because I'm doing a work in you in the midst of that trial. I'm completing in you what I come to complete. You can't complete it. You can't complete it. But the Lord, who's your, your shelter, who's your hiding place, Who's your strength begins to complete those things in you. So when you come out of it, you're not lacking in the area in which God is causing you to walk in. So patience ain't a bad word. As we used to hear, oh God, I pray for patience. Because it comes a trial. But God said in the midst of that patience, count all joy because I'm doing something in you. I'm completing in you. And my joy is your strength. So let me work my work in you in the midst of your trial. So when you come out of it, you're complete and lacking nothing. Let me do my bidding. As the Lord says, let me work in you. Quit moving too fast. Let me work in you. Like a child, you give them something to do and they're very excited. Next thing you know, they're doing this. And then something else pop up. A cartoon come on. They're distracted. In the midst of our trial, we become distracted because why are we focusing more on the trial? I'm looking at the trial. I'm looking at what I'm going through. I'm looking at what I got to endure. I don't like where I'm at. I don't like the situation. But the Lord said, be still. Let me complete it. Let me do what I come to do and what I can do in you so that you won't be lacking nothing when you come out of the situation. But if you don't let me, you're going to walk out now prematurely and hasty and whoa, God, what was that? I told you, son, come back in here. Let me finish it. Let me complete it. So when you face it or what you're going through or what you're trying to take you to, you won't be lacking in any area because it'll be the Lord that completes it. He satisfies us. He satisfies us. He can put his work in us. As believers, we should be walking in the wisdom of our God. As believers, we should be walking in the wisdom of our God. Just simply ask for wisdom. Not worldly wisdom, not Patrick's wisdom, not me going to school and getting knowledge for knowledge puff puff up. But the Spirit brings life. I need wisdom from the Lord. Dealing with today's situations and today's problems or what I'm about to face or what I don't know what I'm about to face, I need God's wisdom. I need this my wisdom for what I learned which is good. Basic knowledge is good. But I need God's wisdom. I need God's insight. I need this wisdom to help me that's better than silver and gold. I need this wisdom. 
verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally, who gives all freely. You need wisdom? Ask God. God, I don't know what I'm going to do. Ask God for wisdom. I don't know how to fix this problem. Ask God for wisdom. Quit seeking our own ways and moving too hastily to ourselves and thinking we got the idea and go to the Lord. Lord, I need wisdom. I don't know the outcome. I don't know how to walk in the situation. If I do, I still mess it up. I'm human. I do things off tendency sometimes to please me. But I need your wisdom so that you be glorified in it and I walk right. And if there's need any healing in the situation, I'm walking in your wisdom so that your healing can come forth. And the Father said, if you lack it, ask of it. And I give it to you freely. I forget to you freely. And without reproach and without punishing you. Ask for wisdom. God gonna punish me. He said he won't reproach you. He won't punish you. But you gotta ask of it because he wants to give you his wisdom. It's his good pleasure to give you his wisdom. It's his good pleasure to say, oh, my child wants my wisdom. Let me give it to him so I can help them to show them how I want them to govern themselves. How I call them to live so they can see my ways and not the ways of the fall that they was in, but the ways of the Lord. And they know how to think and operate correctly and not according to their own agenda. without reproach, and it will be given to him. Faith produces results, doubt doesn't. Faith produces results, doubt doesn't. You have faith, it's that you can remove mountains. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Doubt brings about nothing but doubt. It doesn't bring about a result that you desire to bring about. It brings about failure, mistakes, mishaps, and things because why? You don't trust in the Lord enough to believe. So I put doubt in there because it comes a consequence where I say, I don't think the Lord may want to move in that direction. I don't believe that God still does this today in time, which multiple believers believe or not believe that. I don't think God is still moving like that in these days of time. I think that was for a season. And they doubt the Lord and, and anything that comes in the church they accept because their faith ain't based upon who the Lord is. It's based upon the feelings and emotions of them. They become soulish, driven by their minds and their wisdom and their emotions instead of having faith to believe God. Faith produces results. Doubt doesn't. Verse 6. But let him act in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. That's what doubt produces. It's like you got a double mind. This mind says goes left, this mind says go right. You know where you're going. You back and forth, toss to and fro. You know what you believe in. You know what you trust in. You doubt the things of the Lord. What God says, go forth, you don't go forth. But what you think go forth, you go forth. You tossed it. You're not stable. So let that man ask for nothing. His mind is doubled. That's what doubt produces. Therefore, I says without faith, it's impossible to please God. You gotta have faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Your faith in the Lord, your faith in what the word speaks about draws you closer to God and it produces the results. Faith makes me go when the scripture says, if there are any sick among you, let them bring them to the elders of the church, let them anoint them with oil and pray over them, and by the prayer of faith they may be healed. That's my faith to lay hands on you according to the word to believe that. But if I doubt it, I'll be double-minded. I'm not believing that. Then I won't see God working through his body to heal someone because I'm doubting. Now I'm stable in what I believe in. And that gives the enemy room to begin to come in and drop little things in my mind that cause me now to question my walk with the Lord and make me think that, oh, do I really believe this Bible? Do I really believe this Jesus? Little thing that creeps in subtle, sneaky, 
conniving, deceptionable. Doubt gives room for those things. The Lord, the, the scripture says, let that man ask for nothing. I think he's going to receive anything from the Lord. So if we want faith as believers. We got to walk by faith and not by sight. We got to walk in the faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus and who we believe in and not doubt his words, not doubt his teachings, not doubt what he's called us to be. If he called us to be a hospital, be a hospital. If he called Lord what to be and give prophetic words spoken years and years and years and years and years and years and plenty of us here can testify how God has moved in his body and we've seen things that happened that was a stir in his body to let us know that God was speaking and declaring and confirming his word if we're to be the hospital let's be the hospital let's get connected with the Father and walk in wisdom on how to be the hospital Let's walk in position so that God can bring forth what he needs to bring forth to this area, to this body of believers, so that people can be saved, delivered, set free, healed, changed, grow and mature in God. And the Father be exalted in all of that. But we got to believe. We got to walk in faith. We got to trust and rely on the Lord. James was dealing with an issue with believers concerning temptation. Was it from God or not from God? James was dealing with an issue with believers concerning temptation. Was it from God or not from God? And James was writing to Jewish believers, those of Jewish faith who became converted to Jesus. And now he's dealing with an issue because some thinking the temptation comes from God. Some thinking it didn't come from God. And this is what he says in verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been tempted, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. People thought that so he had to address the issue. He had to address it because someone in the congregation was thinking, hey, God tempted no, 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 let me address this so we can deal with this issue that's going about so we know the truth. Truth sets you free. Truth delivers you. So let me discuss this with you. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. Then when he Desire, when, and when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. He let them know, hey, it ain't God that done this. It was your own desire to choose to follow these ways of living. The things that God says come from among them. Touch an uh, unclean thing. Be separated. In the old covenant as well as comes along in the New Testament of who we are as born again believers so that they would know that when you're tempted don't lie in it and say well it must be from God so I must I must I must do this what's been tempting me then I must I must it must be a God thing for me to go and do this right here and no you've been deceived you've been tricked God doesn't tempt you with evil, nor can God be tempted with evil, but it's your own desire to choose to do these things that leads you out like this. It's not the Lord. So he gets the stuff correctly put in perspective so the believers can understand that, hey, wait a minute. I got to mature up. I got to grow a little bit in this. I got to realize what the Father's doing and what he isn't doing and what is me and what's the enemy. Our God is perfect, complete. In him all that we need, there is no lack in our Lord. Our God is perfect, complete. In him all that we need, there is no lack in our Lord. No lack. He's perfect and he's complete. And there is no lack in him. Verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and 
every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father for light, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creation, born again, first fruit of what he produced, what he brought in, the life of being saved. In him there is no lack, there is no shadowing or turning or variation of God saying, maybe I might be God one day, maybe I not be God my day. Maybe I might be a God of covenant, I might not be a God of covenant. There's no shadow of turning from who he is. He is who he is. He has to turn from who he is to become evil or wicked or become a covenant breaker. If he's a covenant peace man, he's a covenant God, he's a covenant God. He doesn't become an uncovenant God. He's a God of truth. He's a God of truth. He doesn't become a God of truth. He's a God of healing and miracles. He's a God of healing and miracles. He doesn't become a not God of healing and miracles. He is who he is. Amen. There's no variation. You don't see him varying from who he is. Getting off track. As we tell kids, man, stay on track. He doesn't get off track. He stays on who, focus of who he is. God is God. That's why I say he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's on track. There's no shadow turning in him. You will see a shadow of his body turning. You will see a shadow of God's spirit moving in the direction opposite of who he is. He will always be who he is. He will always be who he is. He will not turn from who he is. Irregardless of what we may think in life and what may come on this earth, or who may rise up and say, God has is, God is changed from being, they're lying. There's no shadow of turning in God. There's no variation of him being off of who he is. He's the same Elohim in the beginning as he is now. He's the same I am in the beginning as he is now. He's the same God that spoke forth creation back then as he is now. There's no shadow of turning from that. Here's who he is. He's the same covenant God back then as he is now. We get to understand that and realize that so that our faith won't be tossed to and fro due to tickling of the ear gospels or lying the deceitfulness of the enemy to keep us from understanding the true identity and the attribute of our Father, of our God, and what He produces and who He is. He's perfect, complete. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. These three should be governing us in the midst of our trials. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. These three should be governing us in the midst of our trials. In the midst of our trials, these three main things should be governing us. Swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Verse 19, so then my brethren, so then my beloved brethren, that every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In your wrath, you're not producing God's righteousness. You're producing yourself and what the enemy wants you to produce. Because you're angry, you're aggravated, you're frustrated, and you're not slow to speak. You're going to say what's on your mind when you're mad. Someone make you mad and you ain't aware of it. Stuff come out. I'm, I'm guilty of it. I've done it before too. Somebody step on your toes, rub it the wrong way, got on that last nerve, stuff come out. We're human. Stuff come out. But the word says we got to now change the attitude. The attitude of our minds now has to be changed. The way we think when it comes to things like this got to be changed. We got to deal with the attitude of our minds. Instead of me now being blurish and quick and to say something, I got to be slow to speak. Instead of me trying to say everything and not get nobody's attention, I got to be swift to listen, to hear. Let me listen to what they're saying because I might misinterpret what he was saying. He might be saying you've done good, you know, but um, next time, go over the hill that way instead of going this way. Oh man, if I didn't listen to what he was saying, I'm getting offended. I'm thinking he's told me I went the wrong direction. He said you've done good. But next time, a better way would be go over the hill left. Not slow, not, not quick to, to, to listen, 
I'm going to take that and say, oh man, he said I've done something wrong. Because I went quick to listen to the whole thing. So then I jumped to a conclusion and now I'm not slow to speak. And now I'm not slow to wrath. But if I was swift to hear, I wouldn't listen to it. He said I did a good job. He's giving me a better direction on where I need to go to help me get to my, my destination. So then I'll be slow to speak. And I'll be slow to wrath. But if I do the opposite of it, I'm going to produce that result. I'm going to string me and holler with you. To try to prove my point. My opinion or your opinion? Which one going to win? Who leaves now defeated? Both of us. Because we accomplished nothing. All that we done was argue. Didn't bring about no healing, no resolution. This is my agenda. You didn't see it my way. But when I'm slow to speak and slow to wrath and swift to hear, it gives me a better understanding. Then when we leave here, we both can see each one's perspective. Oh, you see it that way, and I see it this way. But in the middle, it all makes about Jesus. Yes. So now we got agreement. It all makes about Jesus. Now we're walking together in love. In the character of the Father. And about. Because I see from your perspective, you saw from my perspective, my best swift to listen and slow to speak and slow to wrath. And now we see that we both are trying to get to the same thing. What? Jesus. And in that we saw healing. To be able to pray for one another now. To be able to see each one's perspective. And to come together in the name of the Lord. And see God be exalted. Instead of leaving frustrated, aggravated. And now I've been accused of my brethren, which is the enemy. So in our trials, in our tribulations, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. These three should be governing us in the midst of our trials. Jesus spoke of being doers of the word. Now James is dealing with that same topic. Jesus spoke multiple times of being doers of the word. Now James is dealing with that same topic. 22, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Wow. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and in it not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the works, this one will be blessed in what he does. He said you'd be blessed in what you do if you are a doer of the word. Like I read earlier in, in Joshua, they were speaking of it. Joshua 1 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you should meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and, 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 and it's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Similarity of what Joshua is saying, similarity of what James is saying. Keep the word in you. Meditate on it. Watch the word does exactly what the word said it would do. Watch God bless you and keep you. Watch God prosper you. Watch God's face shine upon you. Watch him be exalted. When you take that time to read his word, we can do anything else during the day we have time for. Everybody has 24 hours. Everybody's busy. But we still should have time to meditate on what we trust and believe in. Our faith is in God. So we got to be doers and hearers of his word to produce the result of his word. 
to get his results. I can't go to a mechanic unless he know how to do heat and air like Scott and tell him to come to my house to do heat and air. He'll be like, man, I'm a mechanic. I didn't study how to do heat and air. So I don't know nothing about your air conditioning, but I can tell you about a guy that does that. That's a pretty good guy. So we can't expect to get God's results if we ain't spending time with God. It's like working out. People go to the gym, they work out. Someone looking at them, man, I want to be like you, I want to look like you, I want to feel like you. Come to the gym. I ain't got time. Boy, you're going to get the results. I mean, plain and simple. That your nays be nays, your nose be nose. So if you ain't got time to spend and seek the Father's face, to pray with him, guess what? You don't get God's results in your life. Is God holding from you? Nope. We sure isn't. He wants you to hold these ways. He wants you to experience him. But do you want to experience him? Do you want more of God? Are you satisfied with the state where it? Is there a yearning to desire to draw closer to God in his ways and be a doer of his ways or just to stay where I'm at? Ain't in my front yard, so I'm good. Ain't in my backyard, so I'm good. I'm okay. Or there's a desire in you to yearn for more of Jesus. To desire to grow and to mature in his word. And to be doers of his word, not just hearers. For these ways prosper you. To walk in God's ways. To know him in a deeper, intimate way. The more I read the word, the more it draws me to want to know God more. Because I begin to read of how he moves and the things he does. And, and I want to experience these things. I just don't want to hear about them. I want to experience them. The wonders that the song that we listened to this morning. The miracles. God still does these things. Just we're aware of them. But I want to see them in his body. Not just to hear a song and to say, oh yeah, God still moves. Look at Asbury. That's awesome. I want to experience that here. The Lord didn't speak of the Lord what years and years ago through multiple prophets over and over and things being manifest into being a building debt free for us to sit here and say, oh, well, he done these things for a reason to get our attention to see how awesome he is. How he caused a man, was it London, to come over here and begin to bring a frame from London, away overseas. To come and work on this building. Why? It was God showing us how faithful he is to Lord Wood, where he's called us to be, where he wants us to walk in, where he wants us to experience. So that we can see the attributes of these things happen. But we gotta be doers. We gotta be connected with the Lord. We gotta walk with Him to know these things so that when it comes, we'll be ready to usher in God's presence and to bring about what God wants to bring about to those who are coming to this building to be healed or restored or strengthened. But we gotta be ready. So we gotta be doers of His Word, walking in His truth, letting Him be exalted and glorified in our lives. Letting him be our shelter, our way maker, our direction. The importance of having self-control, patience over our tongue, slow to speak. The importance of having self-control, patience over our tongue, slow to speak. Verse 26, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceive his own heart, this one religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. The importance of having self-control Patience over our tongue, slow to speak. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit, self-control, patience. Let Holy Spirit have His work in you.
really. Let Holy Spirit have his work on you so we know how to bridle our tongue so we'll be slow to speak, swift to hear, slow to wrath. He's not just a tongue that we speak in another language or a goose pimple or a chill. He's the Lord. For the Lord is the Spirit. And with the Spirit of the Lord is there's liberty. Let him help us so that our tongue and our conversations will be to glorify the Lord. You got a helper. Jesus says, and the helper will come. The Spirit of truth, he will come. And he will guide you in all truth. That's what our Lord proclaimed of Holy Spirit. Who is him? Father, Son, Spirit, one. This helper will come. And what this helper will do, he will lead and guide you in all truth. He will produce the results of the Father in you. Amen. <laughs> God, has, God has called us to pure and undefiled religion. But for him, what does that look like? God has called us to pure and undefiled religion. Pure, undefiled religion. People say, I am not religious. But what does, what does religion, what, what is, 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 is God's religion? What is this pure, undefiled religion that God has called us to walk in? What does it look like? Verse 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father's this, to visit orphans and widows in their troubles and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now go a little deeper with me. We'll turn into Matthew chapter 25. To kind of explain what James was hitting at when he said that. But God is faithful in all that he does. He produces desired results and everything. Verse 34 through 40. Then the king would say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Our, take you in? or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. That's what James reflected from, what Matthew has said. For the Holy Spirit was drawing and knitting together what it meant. Not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word and carrying out the purpose and the plan of what the Father had caused us to do, to walk in. So when you've done it to the least of them, you've done it unto me. Because now you're becoming doers of my word, not just hearers. Not just hearing a nice sermon, but actually seeing that sermon be alive in you. I hear a nice word preached, a nice word prophesied, but hearing that word and letting that word come active in you through your faith and you producing the results. You being that doer of that word, not just a hearer of that word, and you carrying it out. Simply by praying for someone, the Lord said, You've done to the least of them, you've done to me. And their need of time of prayer and needing a breakthrough, you took time out to pray for them. Took time out to go and get someone some clothes that you had in your closet that you couldn't wear no more, didn't know that they needed clothes. Took time out, you know, when the Lord, the guy came to me at QT, he said, man, in his truck, said, man, I don't want no money. I'm not asking for no money. It's an older guy. He said, man, but this old man hungry. Can you feed me? I said, what you want? He said, man, give me something, man. He said, give me some hot dogs. I said, you want like pizza? I said, yeah. We're going to bought him two pizzas and bought him a drink. He said, man, thank you, man, I'm hungry. The simplicity of feeding that man. Man, you're a grown man. He made me down with his luck. And the Lord said, okay, now, 
produce me in this man's face. You believe me. I'm in you. You preach my word. Are you a doer? Or someone that speaks about it? Faith in action. That's what James was talking about. That's what Matthew was talking about. That's pure religion. That's pure before the Father. Because you're carrying out what he calls you to carry out. You're doing what he calls you to do. Not just a hero that listens and observes, but one who does it. Who produces God's results. And in this, in this verse 27 it says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Unspotted from the world. To keep oneself unspotted from the world. Let's turn to Romans 12 to kind of see where James and the Holy Spirit was guiding him. So that we can see why he came with these, this verse, what, what was God speaking? Why was God saying this? And remember earlier, the pure under fire religion is visiting the orphans and those who are in prison, the widows, and clothing them and visiting them. And the Lord said, you've done it to them, you, the least of them you've done unto me. Now keep it oneself spotted from the world, not being worldly. How do we do that? What is James saying? In verse 2 of Romans 12, I'm going to read 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, what is pure, undefiled religion. In a nutshell. He gave us the answer. What are we going to do with it? Is it this a nice sermon, a nice word, or is it to say, wait a minute, God, I haven't been walking in it. Your word don't change because I change. Your word don't change because it's 2023. Your word don't change because it's March. Your word don't change because it's raining outside. Your word don't change because they got laws being passed and we didn't disagree with them. God's word is still God's word. We're still born again believers. We want the results that God's word says he will give to us. We got to produce them. We got to meditate on them. We got to have faith to believe in them. We got to trust to rely on what the Lord says about his word. To be unspotted means to be transformed. Have your mind renewed. Not to think the same way you used to think about things. Those who keep their minds to the upon Christ Jesus be kept in perfect peace. Walking in these things. Renewing your mind. To be able to express God's ways. So that you would know what is acceptable and what is perfect will of God. He given us the answer, church. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to walk in it as doers of the word? Or just simply go through life and let it dictate us? Lord, I'm following you. As Peter said, when he said to Peter, Peter, are you going to leave now? Lord, where can we go? For you have the words of life. Lord, I got to follow you. I got to be a doer of your word. I got to trust and rely on you and let your word be that lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. I got to make time to get in your presence. If it's just one minute, I mean, it's still on the way. I got to do that. God is too good to us. He's way too good to us. If we look back through our lives and see all the things he's brought us through and how he's kept us, how he's been with us, but we didn't have a way out of situations, but somehow we had a way out. And how his love is still present in our lives. And how we're still saved and born again. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. No angel, no demon, no life, no death. Nothing can separate us from this eternal God, his love. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, we bless you.
whenever the whole issue with Goliath facing the army of Israel. The scripture says, who is this Philistine? So it wasn't that, because everybody's always, like how you mentioned, God didn't tell me to do this. God, God didn't tell me to go after you. Should, it would already be in you to know it. So it's not like, so, so they waited for God to come down and deliver them from, from Goliath when God had gave it already to them. They already had the power to defeat Goliath and that entire army because they were afraid of him. That one person, it wasn't the army, it was him. So instead, it's like they were just waiting. It's like, what? And then you had one boy that, that come up and said, Who is he? Why is he still here after he's, he's cursed the God of Israel? Why are we not doing anything? When you're sitting around waiting for God to move when he's already given you the power to do it. God should not have told us to fight him and take him out. We already know to do it because of who he's talking against. And then right before he went to kill the lion, God didn't say pick up the stones. He knew to pick them up. He knew to grab them. Not only did he grab one, he grabbed the rest to take out the rest of his family. Hearers and doers of the word. I just wanted to add that. Like he, he knew it. Instead of waiting for God to tell you, God's already given you the insight and the guidance like you just got through preaching to move. Hearers and doers of the word. Not just hearers. You got the hearers in Israel, but they weren't doing it. And we're talking Old Testament. We ain't even talking there. Just wanted to point that out. Amen. 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 Let us be doers of Anyone that's got anything the Lord spoke while we are his ministry? God is faithful. Like I said earlier, God is still moving. I mean, I look at the Asbury movement and the things that took place and it happens and how God does things not just to do things, but he does things to get our attention to focus on him. In the midst of a world that's corrupt in its ways and it seems like it's going wicked and evil, God still pours out the Bible. He sparks folks up to let them know, I'm still Lord. I'm still redeemer. Man doesn't control nothing. I am. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And all of them that dwell therein is still true. And he pours his presence out when people seek his face. And the doers of his word. Declaring his truth. And it attracts folks from overseas, folks from way on the other side of, 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 of America to come to a small town. And then take that with their receipt to their hometown or to other colleges. Wow, God's moving. God stirs people up. Well, I've been thanking the Lord that we have this place and it's prepared and ready exactly. for whatever He wants exactly. to do and whoever He wants to bring. That exactly. it's ready and exactly. we're here. And we're exactly. waiting and we're ready. Exactly. That's why all those words were spoken before we came to this building because God had already prepared everything. So when the building come, preparations are already done. Mm -hmm. He's already made the way straight. Mm -hmm. Now we just believe and trust in the Lord to do what he's going to do. And we allow him to be God. We're still here for a reason, people. Yep. We all could have left. We faced the trials, tribulations, the last the Last 10, 11 years of here or more, but God is still faithful to us. We're in a debt free building. We're not a church in debt. God is still faithful to us, giving us life, the strength, and help. Send our generations, our kids, our grandkids. God is still faithful to us. we got to believe, trust. And let him be exalted. And let him do what he said he's going to do in this building. Among his sons and brothers. So Lord, we thank you. We bless you. Your honor. Yeah. I do have a prayer request. Mm -hmm. Seth has court on Tuesday. Okay. And um, I think that Lindsay has had eight continuances. It's ridiculous. Wow. And um, I'm just praying that, you know, his children want to see him. That it's a visitation issue. Well, there's more to it. But... I'm just praying and he's seeing the chief district court judge this time for the first time. And I'm just praying that he will see the ridiculousness of this situation and will allow visitation to happen the way it should because those children cry wanting to see their daddy. And um, it's just not right. And so it's been going on for two years. Two years. So just... 
And a praise report, um, John and Seth had not even spoken to each other in over two years, and they reconciled and they fell, you know, hanging together, and that's a real miracle. That's um, awesome. So I know Seth's not where he needs to be, but the Lord is working in his life, and um, John and Allie have gone out to eat with him. They, you know, done things together. John and Allie came to our house this week and ate, and it's just... John's going through some things with the small intestines, what they're thinking it is now, but um, the Lord's working in my family, and I'm very thankful, and just still praying for Seth's, you know, heart towards the Lord would change, but um, he, those children want to see their daddy, and um, it's not right the way that visitation situation is right now. Well, we pray for those heavens of Lord, Lord. Thank you for Remind the brothers. Thank you for the, the brother and his mom, myself, and John. Father, we thank you for what was started in the Lord, that it will continue, Father. For what you produced them at an early age, the affection and love they had towards one another, Lord, continues. That bond continues. For you strengthen them in their weak areas, Father. You continue your good work in them. You continue your good work in me. You bring forth your ways out of situation, Lord. That you be glorified in these heavens of men. Young men of faith, Lord. Young men of faith, Lord. I just believe that, Lord. I believe every word that was put in them, Lord, that they produce it. That one plant a seed, another come along the waters, and you add an increase, Lord. I believe the increase you bring about in their lives will come about, Lord. And that you will call them to be, Lord, what you call them to be. Father, let's pray for the court situation, Jesus. That you have a judge's heart, that you turn it in the way you please it, Lord. And that healing comes between the children and Father and their Father, Lord. There be no separation gap between the and the children, Lord. That you cause the union him to be a father to his children, Jesus. And they begin to spend time with him, Lord. So we pray that you cause the court system to line up accordingly, Lord, that any deception, any deceiving, any accusation of brother, Lord, be cast down, and your ways be exalted, your truth be exalted, and you restore the relationship, Lord. Father, we pray for Lindsay as well, Lord. We pray for our heart to return towards you, Jesus. That if anything is not towards you, in her, Lord, in any one of the Father, let me turn towards you, and that you be glorified, you be exalted, and that your purpose and plan in this whole situation come about. That you cause healing to take place, Lord. Forgiveness to take place, Lord. And that the union, Lord, of the <coughs> children, Father, be restored. We bless you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for on Tuesday of your report. We believe your truth. We believe. And we thank you and we praise you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.